So how to start assessing a patient? Okay, so let's take a patient now, shall we? Um, so Sylvie, down on the bench. So Jill, you're going to look after her. So what we've done is we've done our reading. Okay, now we may decide she's come, she's an athlete, she's come to see us uh, because her performance isn't very good or she's had an injury or she's getting repeated infections, etc., etc., etc. Okay? Now, before we start to actually do any examination, we should do a few little tests. Now, the one I, and I'll show you when we do a practical this afternoon or a demonstration, is the one I usually actually start with is the cross extensor reflexes where I tap the patellar reflex on both sides and test the opposite rectus femoris to see if there's any major structural problems. But we do that at the end of the day. So the first one we want to know is, is her mind working correctly? Is her subconscious and her conscious mind in harmony? Our conscious mind is the thinking mind, which we do only about 5% of the time. What our thoughts should be is the same as our programs that we set or our database, which is our subconscious. So the question is, is the subconscious and the conscious in harmony? If they're not, we may well be playing an old program, a subconscious data program of some event that has occurred previously, and we're not really going to get to the cause of what a problem is at the moment. So if you take a strong indicator muscle, Joe, so she'll do a rectus femoris on the left, on the right side, so you, everybody can see. So I'll get out of the way. Okay, now what you're going to do is get her to cross therapy localized. We're, what we're going to do now is we're going to go across on the emotional stress points. Okay, this is just below the frontal um, eminences here, between the eyebrow and the frontal eminences. Okay, okay so where we're going is here, all right, and on with one hand, and we're doing a comparison of this to the subconscious, which is the greater wings of the sphenoid bone. So we're spanning the thumb on one side on the temple way, I say to the patient, or greater wing, and the index finger on the other side. So you're comparing the conscious to the subconscious. So in relationship to the conscious, how do you like your subconscious? And then we test it, and then we reverse it around the other way. So if you'd like to do that. So did we do the conscious first to the subconscious? Oh, so she's failed. So in other words, her subconscious is not in harmony with her conscious. So we need a torch. So could we have a torch? So we do the same as the left to right. We're going to harmonize her and give her some neuron light therapy. So she has to continue the reference point because that's the reference to her brain. So you both points first there. Good. So she's in weakness and now Jill's going to do one minute of neuron light therapy. So while you're waiting there, um, I tell the patient that uh, the points that you're touching on the forehead are your conscious thinking uh, decision areas. So behind there is your orbital frontal notch of your frontal contact cortex. And this is the area where we do our conscious thinking, known as the executive centers. You know, as we make decisions there. So the big decisions in our life are made there, and they know that because when they put thermography, there was hot, they pick out hot spots in the brain there. Uh, and a hot spot means you've got more blood to the area, which means you're thinking more, you're firing more neurons in that area. The other points you're touching across the temples are your subconscious or your database, all the memory of everything that's ever happened. And the database is not in harmony with your conscious thinking. And by that time, the minute should be up. <laughs> So you now go back, retest that that's nice and strong. Excellent, so we're ready to move. Now, when we move now, we can go in two directions. We can either use the cardiograph, which is what we'll do now, or we can use the beginning and ending points. We'll end up with the same result. So you could use the cardiograph, and we want to do the recording of the cardiograph, but equally we could use the stethoscope direct on the patient. All right. Now, what we'll find here is if we play this back, so what you need is some headphones. And what you have done with your patient is to test the muscle associated with the heart, first of all, and that will be the subscapularis. 
So it's the transverse division of the subscapularis. So if you plug it in the first hull, okay, so and then put it on to, um, yeah, don't put it on yet. Okay, so test the subscapularis muscle on the left and the right. Now what we found is that the with ripe brain people, which most of us are, it'll be the left subscapularis. With a left brain dominant person, it'll be the right subscapularis. So go back to the left one and then put the headphones on. So now what we're going to do is going to get her brain for the first time probably in her life. Well, actually it's not because I think I've tested her before. Um, but the first time in most people's lives, they're going to hear their own heart. So you'll find if you come and test the other muscle, that the other one will probably be strong. Good. And if you test the rectus femoris muscle at this time, it'll be strong. So any muscle apart from, in her case, the left subscapularis, which is the muscle that Dr. Goodhart said is associated with the heart. So we're now feeding back information about the heart to her brain, and her brain's saying, oh, there's a little problem here. So we can use the left subscapularis. Now, that can be um, good, and that's the way we started. The downside is we've only got one muscle, and we sometimes we need to, the other hand to touch things and hold things. So it's good to have two hands free. And what we found is if we inhibit magnesium by a particular element called beryllium, it lowers the resistance of the muscle response. So the richest source of beryllium is emeralds and other um, uh, uh, gemstones. Um, aquamarine is another one which is very rich in beryllium. But we use emerald. Emerald is going to be up in the, in the kit there. So what you have to do here is you take the headphones off. Okay, and now you put the beryllium on, or the, the emerald. Okay. Now put the headphones on. Okay, it has to be this way. Won't you can't just add the the uh, emerald. And now test the rectus femoris, and you should find now all muscles go weak. Okay, now test the other rectus femoris, and you'll see now you can use any muscle you want in the process. Okay, <laughs> so it's allowed you a greater expanse of muscles. So now we've got at least two hands that we can use. So if you want to start off conservatively, you just do the subscapularis. But if you put the emerald on before you do it, you can then use any muscle. And that's fantastic, because we, now we can cross therapy localized. Okay? So now what we want to do is to find out where her problem is. Okay? Now, as we said, she's certainly she's got issues with a low first sound. And therefore, I think she's got hypoxia. So the way to do this is to now, I'll just go through these. We'll jump this, because we'll come back to these in a map, is to put the eyes into distortion. So if you want to take her now through, using a rectus femoris, we're going to go through to the eyes to the left and up. So what we do is habituation. In neurology, that means doing something repeatedly three or four times. You can take the eyes to the left and up and hold them there, but it's not easy for a patient to do that because they just bring their eyes slightly out of that distortion and then it doesn't test. So taking them up as far as they can, three or four times, you've got about 10 seconds after you've done that to do your test. That was negative, was it? Okay. So interestingly, nutrition is negative. So in other words, she doesn't necessarily need anything from a nutritional point of view at the moment. Eyes to the left is toxicity. And um, our brain is saying toxic metals, chemicals, radiation. Okay, clear? All right. Eyes to the left and down is mechanics. So this could be something biomechanical. No? Now I get the patient to breathe in deeply. This checks for cranial problems. You can do this at any time, but I tend to do it around the mechanics. No, and breathe out. Okay, hold it. Um, good, breathe normally. All right. Okay. Now eyes to the right and down for allergy or intolerance to see if the patient is there something that they shouldn't be eating. Eyes to the left, to the right, straight to the right. Exercise. She was strong. Okay, she'll be pleased about that, wasn't she? <laughs> okay. 
Now, what did I say? She needs exercise, didn't I? She'll feel better for exercising. Why will she feel better for exercising? Okay. Why? The reason we'll see in a minute. Okay. Okay. To the right and up, dehydration. Very important this time of the year. Um, you know, this is the time of year when people say, oh, I get cramp a lot. And that's usually because they're th um, dehydrated. Okay, now we go round and round in one direction. Follow the fingers right the way around the circumduction, around the field of vision there. Um, okay. So sometimes this is quite interesting. Sometimes this comes up when you don't expect it. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. Yes. So she may not come in and say she's got an infection, but it's showing. And I've had people who've shown this. And they say, it's funny, last time I came, you said I got something coming. And two days later, I got it. Okay. So you've picked it up before they have. Okay. And then up and down. Up and down, up and down, up and down. And test. Yeah. So what we got, we add them up now, what we got. So what I remember there, we've got exercise. Okay, and we've got an infection, and we've got hypoxia. So you put two and two together and think, well, maybe she needs the exercise to try and increase her oxygenation. So we won't put her on an exercise program yet, but we'll do that once we've got her oxygen. Because once we build her oxygen, she'll probably say, I feel so much better, you know, I want to walk around much more. Okay, but she's got an infection. So we could say <coughs> that what happens with all of us is gradually we build up toxins, and infections. It's surprising, isn't it, how many bugs when you do this you find in people that they don't necessarily complain of. There can be viruses, a lot of fungal molds and spores, although people don't necessarily immediately tell you they've got symptoms. And with that, their, their vital status of their nutrients goes down, their reserve, and so they need more nutrients. But more nutrients don't necessarily get rid of this. So sometimes you've got to give more medicinal compounds to lower the toxins and improve the immune system. But in a minute, we'll see there's a connection between all of this. Okay, so we're bear in mind with Shelly, we do need something which is antimicrobial. And remember, it wasn't to the left and up, nutrients. When this shows, you need a medicine, okay? And that medicine can be a natural medicine or it could be a pharmaceutical. <coughs> and there's times when pharmaceuticals are necessary, uh, but we're gonna look, first of all, for natural medicines. So now we've got two things that we need to, to address before she goes. And then maybe when we, she's a bit better next time she comes, we'll work out maybe what is the best exercise for her to do. She doesn't have to start doing heavy stuff, but we can ask her with a verbal challenge and say the best exercise for her to improve her aerobic performance would be walking, slow walking, brisk walking, jogging, swimming, dancing, clubbing, whatever it might be, you know. So should we take the headphones off and uh, let her go? Okay, now you know, just keep her there, if you will. So that would be one way that you could go in. If you don't have an electronic stethoscope, you could use an ordinary conventional stethoscope. Um, have we got any Bob over there? Do, don't think, I think we got rid of all those, um, sold all those blood pressure kits, didn't we? They all went, yeah, so we haven't got a conventional. Anyway, everybody knows what a conventional stethoscope looks like. You put it on, uh, the, the practitioner puts it on first of all, listens to the patient's heart, finds the optimal part there, and then takes it off the practitioner and puts it on the patient, all right? Now, they're not that comfortable. They're right for short periods, but they tend to be tight in the ears, and that's why they don't cost very much. Okay. If you want a good stethoscope in that way, you have to pay a bit more for the, for the more comfortable bits on the ear. The cheaper the stethoscope, the more painful it is in the ears after, after a short while. So if you're going to put the stethoscope on for 10 minutes, say, with a patient, it can be quite pressing in there. So it's not the most comfortable. So it's worth investing in a little bit more. The, the Think Labs one that we use here, the stethoscope, um, has got beautifully comfortable earpieces. You could wear that one all day. Um, but even those are out of date now because everything is electronic and just uses headphones now, the, the new ThinkLabs uh, uh, phonocardiography one. So let's have a look at um, the possibilities. We go in with the uh, uh, digital stethoscope to do the recording or we use an ordinary stethoscope and get her to listen to heart. We check the subscapularis. Usually it's the left if the person is right brain. So what we usually do here 
is we test the beginning and ending points of the meridians on the face, the yang meridians, and then the yin meridians on the body. So start off, if you will, and do the left, do the um, small intestine. So we're going to get it to do the, I can do the small intestine, okay? Doesn't matter which order you do these. So small intestine, gallbladder. Okay, triple warmer. Okay, stomach. These are the beginning ending points, remember, not the, uh, not the alarm points. Okay, bladder. Okay, large intestine. And conception vessel. What did you find? No. Okay, start again. Keep the leg down a bit. You're too high. That's okay. Okay, so sometimes you miss the point, in which case you've got to go back. And the popular ones that are missed are the small intestine. You come too far forward. So if you put the small intestine, it's always just in front of the tragus of the ear there. So you can manipulate your TMJ ramp. The bladder is a popular one. People don't like the finger in the corner of the eye, so they tend to pull it out a bit, so you can miss the bladder point. Large intestine, too many people put it round here. It's large intestine, I thought it would be. Because people are too far down here, all the books put it here. It's round the crease of the nostril. Follow your own nostril round, the crease of the nostril. Uh, it's, it's where the nasal bone touches. So you've got the nasal cartilage and the nasal bone. It's right on there. You'll feel how tender it is. Okay, books tend to put it right round there, it's not. So stick it right round the corner of the nostril there, okay, and then you'll find it'll go away. Okay. Yeah. Okay, remember what she showed too? Infection, okay? Large intestine. What's your brain saying now? Parasites, isn't it? Okay, probably. Can't th nothing's hundred percent yet. Okay. Now find the yin point. When there's a yang point, there's a yin point. So governor vessel? Okay, uh, kidney. Okay, we'll show you where all these points are this afternoon on a little film, but you should know them by now anyway. Okay, lung. So those of you who've done seminars before will at the same time be saying to yourself, as you're doing it, uh, circulation sex. Uh, not only will you be saying the point, but you're saying what the brain chemical is, which is high or low, and uh, also, what the emotion is. Okay. What did you get? Liver? Liver, yes. Liver followed by spleen. Uh, and finish off with the heart. Occasionally you get two, but let's, let's do the heart. Okay, so take it back now onto the spleen. Okay, so we've got the spleen and the large intestine. All right? So show us the spleen. So weakness, stay there, stay, stay, stay. Okay, now we cross therapy localized on the right side. We do the same side, okay? The large intestine. So in relationship to the spleen, how do you like your large intestine? Okay, she says, I like my large intestine. Okay, the large intestine negates the spleen. Show us around the other way. Okay, so now if you do your large intestine, uh, go, do, 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 go to test that, that she's in weakness. Okay, now touch your spleen in relationship to the large intestine. How do you like your spleen? Now, okay. So which is the primary meridian? Which is the causal? The large intestine. Okay, good. Okay, so you only need to do it one way round because by deduction you can work it out, can't you? Which one negates? So the one that negates is the cause and the other one is the effect, if you like, okay? Now, we could put that in different terms, and we're going to do that. And because you'll find that next time we test her, she'll probably show the large intestine. And, but the spleen may change. She might show a heart, she might change something else. But she'll tend to steady in on one of them, and the other one will vary. And negates is the cause. Okay, it's like glands. If you cross-check the thyroid to the gonads, 
and the thyroid negates the gonads, then the thyroid is more important, it negates everything. So it's just which one is the important one. So one is the cause, if you like, one's the effect. Now, cross therapy like this, which one negates? The one that negates the other is the important one. And the important one comes from your genes, it's your gene expression. It's the cause of all your ailments. Everything that is wrong in your life is because of that. Okay? Now, that large intestine may change also. But what she needs to correct her large intestine won't change. And that's where the genetics is. That's the epigenetics, because you're going to say, ah, now I know what that is. I can now modulate that by taking the following things to build up where I've got the problems. So we would say her large intestine was a genotype, okay? The other is called the phenotype. Okay, so her spleen would be her phenotype. The genotype of a person is the inherited instructions it carries within the genetic code. All right, so this is your genes. The phenotype is the composite of a person's observable characteristics, such as biochemical, physiological properties resulting from the expression of the genes as well as the influence of the environment. So it's how she is now. As a result of those parasites and everything else is the phenotype. Her genotype is what she's made of, thanks to mum and dad. Okay? So if she showed that she had a problem <laughs> genetically, which we all have in some way, because none of us are absolutely perfectly, we will always have it. You know, I realize now I was probably expressing my P5P deficiency when I was a teenager as mouth ulcers. I can remember as, um, I don't know, six year old, seven year old, being sent home from parties because my behavior was so bad. Okay? And of course, what we had as kids was sweets with BDMS of different colors and hundreds of thousands on cakes and jellies. <laughs> And of course, us kids got really quite wild. <laughs> okay, jellies would end up on the walls and so on, and <laughs> you know, typical. And of course, now I realise that was P5P. You know, I had excitotoxins put into me, colouring agents, and I couldn't handle it. I didn't have the cytochrome P450s and things, and because of a P5P deficiency, teenage time I got uh, mouth ulcers. And then you can go through the years, and you gradually see other problems and issues that come. And you say, yeah, I've changed in many ways, perhaps how I've expressed this, different meridians have shown at different times, but they've all been the same thing at the end of the day, it's P5P. And this is what I want you to try and find out on yourself. Wouldn't it be nice if you knew what you really need? And those substances which you really need, A, are in the blockbuster formulas for your constitution, but if there's one of them that you really need, you see, I don't need, I don't really show the folic acid that much, or to B2, B3 is good, and I don't show to most of the minerals, but I do need the P5P. So the P5P is in the green formula, uh, the multiple, but I need a lot more. You know, I need, at the moment, I need five capsules of P5P. I'm a very bad boy. <laughs> okay, and they're 25 each, which is giving me 125 milligrams of P5P a day. 125. Remember what I said the RDA was 1.6. That means I'm not really being able to recycle the B6 and just make P5P. In other words, it's, you know, that's the amount that my body is using. Okay? So you, buddy, may need P5P, but you may need 200. We've had people who needed 300. Okay? And we've got other people who only need you know, perhaps 10 milligrams. So we're all individual. And interesting, we've got some people who are better for taking the liquids. And some people who are better for capsules. And we'll discuss that this afternoon, why that difference is. Uh, and we think we now know what the reasons is. So a genotype is where you're coming from with your meridian, and the phenotype is the meridian that the body's expressing at the moment. So in her case, the large intestine is the genotype. This is where she's come from all the time. Her phenotype is her spleen, and we know that the spleen indicates high histamine in the body. She's got some reaction, an immune system reaction going on at the moment. We suspect because of this, she's got an infection, we will then verify that with the markers for a bacteria, a virus, a fungus, and a parasite. And we, if we don't treat that, we can't get to the real nitty-gritty of where we want to. She's, she, in other words, we could treat her genotype, but she still needs a medicine to get rid of where she is at the moment. Okay? So we do that, and we work out what it is that she needs to get rid of whatever she's got, and we work out what her genotype is of what she needs on an ongoing basis to keep her in the optimal degree of health. Okay, so I think um, let's just roll that one on. That was eyes into distortion. We're going to look at how we're going to look at 
the problems with hypoxia after lunch. Because there's some really interesting um, clinical situations which you'll recognize with yourself and with your patients. Um, 